All right, so we are back at the American Astronomical Society. Uh, like, can you guess that we're at the American Astronomical <laughs> Society? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm here with Adam Frank from the University of Rochester. I've been a big fan of your work with NPR for years. Uh, and, and I have yours. Well, thank you. Um, but what I love is you have been thinking literally, like just obsessing about the same things that I have, except you brought together a team of superheroes to actually run the simulations. <laughs> so, um, the, you know, whenever like people are, are absolutely fascinated by the idea of the Fermi paradox and sort of like the, the primary argument that I bring to the table is this idea that if we know that like an asteroid like Oumuamua can actually make it from world to world, does it seem so impossible that some advanced civilization should be able to make this journey and in just in really in the blink of an eye, any civilization, no matter where it forms across the entire Milky Way, should be able to yeah. colonize or settle the entire galaxy. And that's kind of like the heart of the Fermi paradox. Where is everybody? Right. That was Fermi. Then that was Fermi's question that morning uh, or lunch. It was over lunch in 1950. Um, so when we talk about the Fermi paradox, I like to sort of distinguish because people sometimes have uh, you know it's not clear clear what we're talking about. Um, so for some people, the Fermi paradox is well, why haven't we heard from them? Right. The idea that like well, we've looked at all these stars for uh, signals of alien intelligence and we haven't heard um, anything, so therefore there's nobody out there. Now that version is completely wrong because astronomers just haven't really looked very much. Right. So people often have the sense that every night astronomers are going out right. and looking at you know for signals of intelligence. And in fact, there's never been any money to do that. Right. Um, so uh, there was a paper by Jason Wright last year and collaborators that showed that the parameter space that you need to look through is so large that if you use the metaphor that that parameter space is an ocean, um, how much of that ocean have we looked for? And it turns out it's a hot tub. Right. Right. So it's like looking, you know, for for dolphins in a hot tub. You don't find it, and you're like, well, that's it. There's no there's dolphins no in the dolphins. ocean. Yeah. Yeah. So, so so and so when people make that make that complaint about the Fermi or that or about the search, like. The universe is huge, the galaxy is huge, the chances that we're going to hear a signal from another civilization is absolutely remote, so it's not surprising that we haven't seen aliens. Right. 100% totally agree. Anyone who has sort of spent any time blowing their mind with the Fermi Paradox has considered that. Right, right, right. But, but that's not the part that should freak you out. Right, right. So Fermi was well known for his amazing ability to like in an instant do the calculation in his head and work something out. So he was uh, the, the great story uh, at the atomic first atomic bomb blast. He just dropped some paper, saw how far it got blown back by the winds from the blast and was able to calculate the yield of it. In, in, uh, and it got very, very close to the actual oh, yield from that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when he said to his friends that day, because they had been walking, the story was they were walking to lunch. They were at um, Los Alamos. And so they started talking about UFOs or something, and you know, then the conversation. And they, they were, you know, in their heads, they did some quick calculation about uh, light travel times, <clears throat> or, or, or how fast you could get something to move a spaceship. And then the conversation went somewhere else. And then, like an hour later, over lunch, he turns to everyone and goes, well, "Well, where are they?" And that, what he was really thinking was, he had already worked out the fact that even if you had a spaceship that was moving even at a tenth of the speed of light, that you would, you know, in a time scale that's very short compared to the age of the galaxy, um, be able to hop from planet or from star system to star system to star system, such that in a very short time compared to the age of the galaxy, you would cover everywhere. That every star system would have been visited by your settling right. Uh, civilization. Right. And so, the, so the question is not why don't we see messages from alien civilizations broadcasting from right. distant stars, it's why isn't the Earth covered in alien yes. shopping malls? Right, exactly. Right. Why aren't they here now? Right. Why aren't they on the... Yeah. 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 yeah, and the analogy that I always use is like if you've got a sandwich and you drop a piece of mold at any part of the sandwich, right. you come back a week later and the whole sandwich is covered in right. mold. It has been settled yes. by the by mold. The mold. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> and and it doesn't matter where you start. And no, we're not so saying we're, aliens are mold. We're just, you know, <laughs> no, no. cases any out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and where I think I've always broken down on this is that I haven't actually done the math to calculate, you know, when, when you start to think about that, you get more, it gets more complicated. Like, right. what if, how long will civilization last and how far can they go and will their spacecraft work and will they self-replicating robes work? You guys have done the math now. Right, right. So this whole project came from uh, a, another lunch uh, that happened between uh, Caleb Scharf and I. 
probably about four years ago, and we were asking this exact question. We were going through, you know, sort of trying to think a little bit more about the Fermi paradox, and we were like, you know, somebody needs to do the simulation, right? Not just a calculation of how long does it take to get between two stars, because you've got hundreds of billions of stars, um, and and what, you know, and you've got supernova going off, which can sterilize regions of the galaxy. So somebody needs to do a full-blown simulation. Um, and so then I went back to um, my colleague, who is my former student, uh, Jonathan Carroll Nellenbach, who is one of the most talented talented mathematicians and computational scientists I've ever met. And I said, hey, you know, Caleb and I were talking about this yesterday. And typical Jonathan, he went back, you know, the next day had a simulation working <laughs> with beautiful graphics, right? right? Um, and it took us a little while then to go deeper because, you know, even, even there we began to see some subtle issues, computational issues or, that, that needed to be worked out. But eventually we worked, we were able to get a full-blown paper out of this. And the results were both su not surprising and surprising. So the first way they were um, not surprising was that it, it's really hard to stop the settlement front, right? So there's this idea that, you know, you get one civilization that's born, you know, you got this big disk of a galaxy, you get one civilization that's born, and then, you know, there's this front of settlement that just spreads across the whole galaxy, and it turns out, you know, that this is what, this is what the paradox that, that, that people have been talking about, it is really hard to stop that. Right. You know, people like Carl Sagan had sort of argued like, well, no, the front will stall after a while because of population pressure or other things, and it turns out that it's almost, it's very, very difficult to get that to stall. So in that sense, the Fermi paradox really is a paradox. Why aren't they here now? But then, we, as we started to talk more, we realized there was these other factors. Because the question is, it's not so much why aren't they here now, but were we ever visited, right? right. And if you take into account the possibility that civilizations don't last forever, which of course they don't last forever, right? right? Why would they, right? Yeah. You'd have to... We'll, well, I mean, we only have a sample of one. We know right. that our civilization, let's say modern technology beyond the Stone Age, let's say that we've existed for 10,000 years maybe, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, as a, as, a, as a civilization that's really leaving huge amounts of artifacts or so, really it's farming, right, which is about 10,000 years ago. Yeah. So yeah. it's not until we started to, you know, until we domesticated ourselves yeah. in some sense and settled down and doing, did farming. Um, so, yeah, once you add that into there, now this uh, changes things quite a bit because now you're no longer asking, well, why aren't they here? It's like, well, why weren't they ever here? And actually, how far back could you look um, and know that they were here? So this introduces the idea of evidence horizons. Right. And this, uh, there was a paper that um, uh, uh, Gavin Schmidt at, from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies and I did last year, where um, there's a whole long story, a very interesting story about how that paper came about. But we looked at how would you know, the question, how would you know whether or not there was a previous civilization right. on Earth? Uh, and most people are like, well, of course there wasn't. You know, of course there was no dinosaur civilization. Yeah. But Gavin's point really was like, well, you can't say that unless you actually know what the evidence looks like. And what he had seen pretty clearly was that after about a million or so, a couple million years, all surface evidence is gone. You know, right. you're not going to find any pyramids. You're not gonna, right. Stuff just gets ground down by geological processes. Um, and then, and you can say, well, what about fossils? But it turns out the fossil record is wildly incomplete, right? So you could scatter iPhones everywhere across the Earth, and really none of them are going to make it a million or you know, ten million years into the future. Um, so the fossil record is not, you can't say, well, the fossil record for sure shows us that there was never a previous civilization. And then really what, what uh, Gavin was able to show was that all you have is like weird kind of isotopic anomalies. So all this leads to the fact that, that we don't, you know, if a civilization had, had visited us, visited Earth and set up and a civilization. And built their shopping malls. Right, and built their shopping malls. And that was, say, you know, 30, 40, a half a, uh, or half a billion years ago, all evidence would be gone. Right. right. So that gives you a kind of a, now you have to look at the problem differently. And so what we saw was that, yes, the, the front sweeps through, but now you want to ask, what's the steady state look like, right? Okay, so now they're, you know, if civilizations die after a while, then every planet that is settleable may not have a settlement on it now, right? Even, if, even though the front swept by, that individual uh, uh, planet may have had one at some point, and now it's empty and it's waiting to be settled again. And there, suddenly, it got really interesting where you could have, we found out you could have large voids for a while where uh, there was just, you know, settlement, you know, there might be some settled systems up here, but you could have a big void where, you know, Earth might be sitting in the middle of it and there's just been no settlement in that void for the last half billion years or last 10 million years. Right. So it really showed that in some sense, there really was a space. Everybody had been focusing on just the settlement front sweeping across, and nobody had thought before Jonathan of what does the steady state look right. like. And the steady state allowed 
allows Earth to have been unvisited for, you know, say a million years or 10 million years, even though there's settlements, you know, everywhere else. Right. And so if you, you can kind of overlap your two pieces of work. You can say that, yes, these civilizations could be expanding and settling and backfilling right. and moving around and, and sort of trying to keep the galaxy as settled as they can. And at the same time, the way the stars line up, gaps open up, and move relative, move relative to each and other, the, yeah. and just the lifetimes of various civilizations, that you're going to have places that will go off the grid again yes. for for however long it takes for all evidence to disappear. Right. Right. To to the the level of detection that we are capable of today. Right. Right. But if we in the future do a much more detailed uh, sort of uh, census of every single rock and piece of metal around the entire solar system that could be preserved for much longer periods, right. or if we do a much better analysis of, of what's on the moon, maybe we will find those shopping right. malls because they'll be better preserved in these other locations. Yeah, no, that's why the idea of solar system SETI is really interesting, that you, what you'd expect is that things in or, you know, in deep orbit, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, out by the... Um, uh, asteroid belt or so that something could stay there for a very long time yeah. whereas it, it would have been you know ground down to dust on the earth so yeah what's really interesting about this is it shows you it's it really it, it's a beautiful example of how science works where everyone's like well of course we know that and then you look at it a little bit care more carefully yeah. and you're like well no actually we have no reason to yeah. believe that so you know uh in in the, the 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 first true piece of literature about the fermi paradox was this paper by hart in 1975 where he actually he was the first one to do the, the explicit calculation of how long does it take a probe right. to get from one star to the other and therefore infer how long it would take for the settlement wave to cross the galaxy and he had what he called fact a and fact A was, well, there's no evidence for alien civilizations on Earth, therefore there can't be any uh, aliens anywhere. And as um, uh, Jason Wright, our collaborator, says, well, really, now we should understand that's opinion A. That's not a, there's there's right. no fact there, yeah. right? Other than the fact that they're not here now, okay, they're not here now. Um, but, you know, one million years into the future, or a couple million years into the future, and all surface, the Earth, the Earth's surface has been, like, entirely resurfaced. Yeah. So there's just, there won't be evidence. Yeah. Or you're going to have to look for a very different kind of evidence. Right. Next. And I, I love that. That, as always, the more we think into this, the more complicated it right. becomes, and the more of sophisticated and more nuanced thinking right. you have to do to work out the the parameters. And yet, there are potentially some places where it's unequivocal, unequivocal that if you go to the moon or if you go to the Kuiper Belt and you properly do a census right. of all of these objects, right. a complete survey, a survey. Yeah that a an ancient alien factory out in the Kuiper Belt would be as pristine today as it right. almost was three billion years right. ago because there's not a lot that's going to wear it down out there. And so I think it turns out more evidence is necessary. Right. And in this case, we're probably at the point where we can begin to start thinking about how to get that evidence. So like for the moon is a place where the moon has been um, uh, very well mapped down to fairly low resolution, uh, or not very, fairly uh, small size scales, high resolution, so you can map out small uh, scales. And so there's one of the projects people are thinking about now is doing a kind of a machine learning um, uh, mapping, uh, artificial intelligence uh, 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 exploration of those images to look for things down to the size scale of a yeah. small spaceship or something. So we're really kind of... It just requires a new way of thinking. This, again, what I love about science so much is that often what happens is you ha you have a set of assumptions that it just takes sort of a you know a, a turn, uh, you know, a slight change in perspective. Suddenly realize that there's a whole host of questions where you thought you already knew the answers for. So. Um, yeah. I think this, this journey is just really beginning for us. Wonderful. Well, Adam, thank you so much for chatting with us today. And, a real pleasure. And I really enjoy both the research, but then the way uh, you guys are getting the word out there and, and making it very accessible to everyone. And I think everyone who's big fans of, of you and also just this idea of the Fermi Paradox in general appreciate the further nuanced thinking yeah. that's, that's going on. So uh, where can people find out more about what you're working on if they want to? Uh, my uh, Twitter handle, uh, Adam Frank. Um, I also have a website. If you just type, type in Adam Frank Science, it'll, it'll come up. And your research was recently featured in you with Caleb. Yeah, Scientific American. Caleb wrote an article for Scientific American. Yeah, we'll yeah. Like and I'm still writing. You know, I'm writing. I'm, uh, I still do stuff for NPR and for and now for NBCNews.com. I'm doing some writing medium. I've got various places. Wonderful. All right. Thanks, Adam. Okay, great. Thank you.